Hello. The following is a presentation I gave to a modern Japan history class at the College of St. Benedict on November 4th, 2014. I spoke academically about my science fiction work, seen here, and discussed the relationship between reality and creativity, using examples from my Asian and liberal studies background. This is the structure of the presentation. And here are the diagrams I referenced during the presentation. Additional information about my novels and work as a creative conceptualist, as well as contact information, can be found at the end of the presentation or in the description below. So, without any further delay, let's jet into Reality Through Creativity, a journey of West meets East. I'm happy to be with you here today to talk about my work and my journey of West meets East. The first thing I want to say is that uh, Japan is in us all. It's in us subliminally, meaning we don't even recognize it. It's what I call the subliminal Japan. So when you throw out names like G.I. Joe, Transformers, Voltron, Thundercats, My Little Pony, Mario Brothers, and of course Pokemon, you may or may not think about Japan. I mean, G.I. Joe, it doesn't get any more American than that, right? But the truth is, a lot of these were animated in Japan in the 1980s. It was seen as a cheap labor thing, but as time went on, those same animators that worked on G.I. Joe and other animation from the 80s went on to form studios like Ghibli, which made the Academy Award winning Spirited Away. And if you look closely at those old cartoons from the 80s, you can see certain animation techniques of scaling, framing, color piecing, and speed lines that are distinctly Japanese in those old cartoons. But growing up, I didn't know any of this. It was just all subliminal. So fast forward to the late 90s, early 2000s, and I become aware of Japan's animation or anime through the Cartoon Network block called Toonami. These were Japanese shows, English dubbed, but essentially uncut. It was when I was encountering now the conscious Japan, one that I recognized. Two of the shows that really made the distinction clear for me were Gundam Wing and The Big O. The former is about teens fighting a guerrilla war with cutthroat political themes and uh, dealing with military industrial complex and peace negotiations. The latter was a noir genre tale which talked about the nature of memories and reality itself in the midst of a class warfare. These are supposed to be kids cartoons, but they're dealing with heavy serial themes about life and death far more complex than a Scooby-Doo mystery. And I wasn't just the action that brought me in, but the depth of, and authenticity of the humanity I was witnessing. I was totally blown away, and I wanted to know more about this stuff. I wanted to know more about these types of stories, where they came from, what inspired them. And I had this notion, how might I continue these stories, translate them, inspire them in the West, where some of this depth seemed lacking to me. That's where we get to my Rangaku reversal. You're likely familiar with the term Rangaku, which means Dutch learning. It's a term for learning during, uh, with, uh, it's a term for learning of Western technology and medicine in Nagasaki during the Tokugawa period. One of its students was the influential Fukuzawa Yukichi, which I'm sure you talked about in this class. Only in this case, I'm a Westerner interested in Japanese and East Asian storytelling and how I can authentically infuse my own work with its elements. Ironically, along the way, I learned that Japan has done the same sort of thing over the years, inspired by world religions and 1980s science fiction from America, for instance. But here are three of the elements I discovered in my own Rangaku experience. The first element is mountain versus spiral narratives. In the West, we're familiar with this linear structure. You have exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and a denouement, or conclusion. Simplicity and clarity are rewarded with this model, but it becomes kind of predictable and a little repetitive and boring because you're just on a straight mountain climb most of the time. In East Asia, and by extension Japan, there's a more non-linear model that's used. It can seem a little chaotic at first, but I find it a lot more rewarding. I've heard it referred to as the spiral. On it, you have characters and story arcs starting on different points on the spiral. 
And as the story progresses, all of these different stories and characters are pulled towards the center of the spiral. So you have all these parts that seem separate and, and not connected, but you know they connect somehow, and it, it keeps the reader engaged. You may not meet the, the main character you meet may not be the first character. It may be the third in this format. And every character is often allowed their own mountain narrative within the spiral. So you never know quite when the end is because sometimes a character's end is not the end of the entire spiral. It's still spiraling towards the center. In my own work, for example, you have a prologue dealing with the past and the elder generation. Then you have the results of that on Earth and then a series of events on the moon. All these are intimately connected, but the reader has to pay attention and read between the lines before it's spelled out for them. The result feels more like a roller coaster ride than just climbing a mountain. You can see that there's valleys and peaks, but like a roller coaster, you're not exactly sure what's coming next. In that sense, it's a little more like real life. The second element I utilized was yin and yang. This is a familiar symbol to us but it's often misunderstood in the West. Rather than opposites, they're complementary opposites. We tend to view them in opposition when we see this symbol and are not uh, acquainted with it. But there is light in the dark and dark in the light. So it's kind of like, how can you describe fast, whoosh, if you don't know slow, putt, putt, putt. What this means is that the world isn't made up of static stereotypes like super macho, or super feminine. There is feminine elements in the masculine and masculine elements in the feminine. It's a mixture, it's give and take. And this creates more dynamic and realistic characters and stories when you use the yin and yang. Let me give a few examples from my story. The main character is in disguise as a senator to attend a ball in Washington, D.C. He's in a park lined with cherry trees. One of those cherry trees, which incidentally, cherry trees came to U.S. through a gift from Japan. So that's another connection to modern Japan. The cherry blossom falls on the character's shoulder and he brushes it off. Now in Japan, cherry blossoms, or sakura, are a symbol of transformation. By the sakura touching this character, it symbolizes the physical transformation he's made and to the senator. But for those in the know, it also foreshadows the internal transformation that's going to happen also, as the scene progresses, there's a terrorist attack at this ball, and you have complementary opposites, dancing and fighting, that occurred in the same space. Yet, one is associated with celebration and one is associated with conflict, but they both require great skill. So you have these two forces playing off of one another, just like yin and yang, and it's almost like a waltz for survival. In another scene, you have a character confronting the people responsible for a tragedy involving his mother and you have the past and the present coexisting and affecting one another. The painful memories of the past are being relayed to the reader in one sentence, and then in the next sentence, how those memories of, and emotions of the past affect the character's actions in the present are related. So for instance, this sentence gets the ball rolling. Internally, Chang Wan can hear the speeding wooden warning drums of his village's past, and he matches his attacks in the present to that unbridled, clacking beat. And once the main character sees his mother die in his mind, these sentences follow. The other mammoth bodyguard starts to bring his sword around to cleave into Chang Wan's undefended side, when suddenly the KPA warrior spins with passionate energy. His sword skims off the shimitar it was trapped on, tearing away a spurt of sparks, and knocks the giant backward. Still caught in the same fast rotation, and just off the ground, Chang Wan's sword whirls on the other attacker's blade. The velocity of the blow is so focused that it shatters the second opponent's weapon, while the hook-ended grappling wire comes around like a whip in Chang Wan's right hand and smacks the man across the face, sending him into recoiling steps of pain. In these actions, you see the ferocity of the boy's tears from the past in the present in his 20-year-old self, and how these emotions and the consequences of them are taking a toll on him as time goes on. Incidentally, the sword that he carries is usually kept in a white box, which in China, white is associated with funeral or the, the mourning. And this is representing the mourning of his family who owned the blade originally, including his mother who sacrificed herself for him. Incidentally, she wore a yellow robe 
which often represents courage and heroism in China. The next example is quite literal. There's a character in their office, and they have an Ouroboros death sculpture, which is a snake eating this tail, sim symbolizing the cyclical nature of life on their desk. This statue is colored white and black, just like the yin and yang symbol. And as the scene progresses, the blinds in the room portray a pattern of shadow and light across the character, which visually expresses the dualistic nature of the yin and yang in this character. The third element of inspiration from Japan is mecha. Mecha literally refers to anything mechanical or machinery related, but is often associated with a, giant, uh, with a genre of giant humanoid robots piloted by men and women. In the West, we tend to call them mechs, and they're basically treated as walking tanks. But in Japan, mecha are more elaborate and treated as more than weapons. In the mecha genre, the narrative demonstrates the relationship between the pilot and the machine, the robot they control, meaning the pilot is almost the heart or soul of the machine, and the machine is just a skin. In this, the machine becomes a reflection of the pilot's will and self-development to overcome both internal and external obstacles. In my novel series, I use different classifications to emphasize this. I have bionic mecha, which represents the Western conception of mechs as a military augmentation. And then I have Tekian mecha, which has a nerve interface system where the pilot's biomechanical or biochemical will is actually transferred through the machine. So there's a real connection between the machine and character, giving the action more meaning than it otherwise would have. When I was at CSBSJU, I took a semester of the Japanese martial art Aikido as part of my Asian philosophy class. Aikido is a defensive martial art where you defeat an attacker or disarm them through using their own energy against them. As such, you have to learn to let go and act with subconscious efficiency and minimal energy. So if someone grabs you on the wrist, rather than yanking, you just spin your wrist and you break the hold like that. You make sure you're limp and you're using their energy, all of their energy against them. What this is, is I use this give and take, this yin and yang from Aikido. It plays out in a training scene in the third book where two romantic interests who are not only learning to control the techie and mecha I mentioned with precise command of their nerves, but they're also trying to overcome the differences in their socioeconomic backgrounds, which is a tension in their relationship. It's another way I subtly layer the story with the techniques I've been speaking about, and this would have not happened if not for my Asian studies experience here at CSBSJU. Now I want to move on from the Rangaku reversal and talk about history. The mecha genre I talked about came from the aftermath of World War II. The aspirations and nightmares witnessed by those who survived the war formed the genre bit by bit, processing the horrifying advancement of technology they saw, things or heard about, things like the V-2 rocket or the atomic bomb at Hiroshima. There was this sense that Japan didn't keep up enough with the West technologically and that they suffered in the end. From that trauma, some storytellers began to conceive of mecha or giant robots as a humanized answer or super weapon to what could be a savior or harbinger of destruction for Japan and the world. And this is where you have a two-way street in Japan regarding history and fiction. If you look at the word history, if you cross out the H and the I, you get story. History is essentially a giant collection of stories put into one narrative. So in Japan, the relationship between reality and creativity is that much closer than in the West. Let me give an example. There's been an island fortress mentality in Japan. It goes back to the Kamikaze, the divine winds protecting Japan from the Mongol invasion. The idea of Japan wanting to be this isolated island fortress in the face of a siege by Admiral Perry and his black ships, but being forced to give in for fear of cultural destruction from the outside world and its technology. This is referenced across numerous Japanese stories, allegorically or directly. In Japan, there is an anime called Fafner, where an island is literally an island fortress. In other words, it's a mechanical island, like an aircraft carrier. And if it's threatened, it can defend itself with an arsenal of built-in weapons. Or if it's contaminated, it can actually separate chunks of the island and detonate them. It even has a number of satellite islands that follow it, which can also be set adrift. 
there is this mentality that you have to protect yourself from the outside world when you're an island nation. And you can see this during World War II, where Imperial Japan tries to barricade itself with its neighboring islands to protect itself from rivals such as the Allied forces. Another back and forth between reality and creativity is Operation Yashima. In March 2011, after the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster, there was a call by TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, for Japan to conserve its power. And this sparked a Twitter campaign dubbed Operation Yashima. Now, this refers to the anime franchise Evangelion, where Operation Yashima is when all of Japan has to pool together its electrical power to power a positron rifle to repel a, a monstrous invader. What's interesting is that Operation Yashima itself is a reference to the Battle of Yashima, which took place in 1185 in March and involved what else but a fortress. So here we have art imitating life and life imitating art in a cyclical fashion. The island fortress mentality is being infused into Japan's stories, but at the same time you see these fictional stories being used to rally the Japanese people and affect history. This Japanese interplay between reality and creativity really intrigues and excites me. It's different than simply dramatizing real events in, say, a biopic. So I wanted to take these ideas and expand them on a global scale. There have been others who've been inspired by Japanese stories and techniques in the West. Uh, the Matrix series, Pacific Rim, Titanfall, all came out of this. And even Captain America 2 employs a Japanese portrayal of missiles called the Atano Circus in its last act, where you have missiles fanning out and essentially, da essentially dancing in midair as they chase a target. But as this proves, the Japanese elements are often done piecemeal. Uh, you, don't, you get the fun flourishes, but you don't get the full substance. In terms of consistently pulling together all of the elements I've been talking about, I've rarely seen that done, and certainly not when I began my endeavor. And this brings me to the World Union. We've heard about concepts like NAFTA, the European Union, the Arab League, these political and economic bodies and arrangements in our present world. And premature or not, there's even been talk at times and discussion and debate about a North American Union that would further integrate Mexico and Canada with the US in its defense and economic systems. Well, what I've done is expanded these ideas, these notions, to create a global government made up of eight macro unions. North American Union, South American Union, African Union, European Union, Middle Eastern Union, Euralian Union, Oceanic Union, and the Asian Union. This provides a really interesting and inclusive stage for exploration and simulation. Because within these giant unions, you still have smaller municipal bodies of other unions. So the North American Union has the United States Union, Asian Union has the Chinese Union, and so forth. I've talked about history, but history sometimes gives us this limited view of relating and understanding what elements led up to a certain event. This is because even with primary documents, we may or may not have all the viewpoints or factors, and as time goes on, events seem more distant. So when you create something in a story like the World Union, you have the luxury of explaining where all the pieces fell into place. It gives you a broader perspective of understanding and recognition that you can take back into reality. So let me give you a few examples of what I'm talking about. The World Union comes about in an era where there's been significant environmental and economic uh, disasters, which are interconnected because if you think about the Fukushima disaster, it had a significant effect on Japan's economy through its energy needs. And the consequences would likely be even greater if something like that would happen in China, whose leaders have expressed concerns over the environment. We've seen how fast economies can tumble like dominoes in these kind of scenarios, whether it's the 97-98 collapse of Thailand's currency or the 2007-2008 financial crisis on Wall Street here in the U.S. Now, when you have these kind of disasters, you have uncertainty, and there's a mentality of going back to what's perceived as safe, a traditionalist approach which can result in some high ideals that may or may not be effective. You've seen it with the Tea Party reactions in the US where there's this call for more isolation. You also see this in the run-up to World War II with Japan, where amidst fears of foreign imperialism, the samurai from the Satsuma Rebellion that had been defeated by the Meiji government re-emerged in political positions where they promoted older ideas like reverence to the emperor and aggressively fending off the foreigner barbarians. This while doing amidst the same modern notion of Fukoku Kyohei, rich country, strong army. From all this political alchemy, you have these strong notions such as Asia is one and the greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere. 
where Japan would become an imperialist aggressor and exploiter itself in order to secure its economic needs and protect itself from Western colonialism. In a sense, World War II Japan is creating a barrier around themselves in the expanded version of the island fortress mentality I mentioned. Now I have a parallel in the formation of my world union in that the, in the face of the aforementioned economic disasters, there's a traditionalist movement called the classical revolution. It manifests itself in different ways for different countries. But this eventually inspires the West to form the world unification movement, thinking it'll help prevent these different economic and environmental disasters of the past. Only as this movement moves eastward, it understandably hits resistance. And the strongest resistance comes from a group formed originally in China calling itself the Asian Separatist Army or the ASA. There are suspicions of, the wor of World War II and they carry on and they see the West's advances, rightfully so, as neo-colonialism. So the ASA, like the Japanese Imperial Army, attempts to create a barricade from Western influence. They are ultimately put down in what culminates in a controversial tactical nuclear strike just as World War II ended. But the world unification movement is completed. But this doesn't stop the tensions, just like the end of World War II didn't stop the tensions. For instance, the, the new World Union government has it so that in a small, on a small level, they have so that uh, people's names are often addressed first name, last name now, as opposed to the traditional Asian way of last name, first name. And there's bigger problems, such as the intermittent, uh, intermittent disputes over islands like the Kuril and Sakhalin Islands, which happen to this day, and territorial waters and other issues. Japan itself is placed in an awkward position because while it's officially part of the Asian Union, it has less formal but equal ties with the North American Union because of the past with, with uh, World War II. This should maybe sound familiar because the thematic connections in my novels can be seen not only in parallels between the Greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere and the Asian Separatist Army, but in current events of newspapers today. In fact, shades of what happened in Egypt in the last several years was already in my second book beforehand, showing that parallel of creative recognition where art can imitate life and life can imitate art. Therefore, if you're new to historical events or feel distant from them, you can see events or see events you just can't wrap your heads around, you have new anchor points for comparison and understanding. And if you're studying history and you've read about a similar event, you have an anchor point to increase your interest in said event because you've seen it expressed in a creative way beforehand. That's what my mantra of reality through creativity is all about. It's a yin and yang conversation. Let's take Japan's post-war issue of nationalism versus pacifism, which is a central issue it's dealing with even as I speak. I have a character of mixed European and Asian heritage who epitomizes this issue on a global scale. He's a former soldier who helped form the World Union, just as Japan, uh, post-war post Japan came to assist the global economy. He's pushing a peace agenda in the World Union as the World Union starts to face more and more internal strife. Yet he's a talented soldier who has in his office on one side of his desk a samurai armor and the other side a medieval knight from Europe's armor. So you visually see the DNA of the warrior and the soldier, yet he's also trying to promote a pacifist view. So what you have here is a thematic representation of real life yin and yang issues coming out of this one character. These, all these east and west tensions are intended to show how counterintuitive they are. It's not about creating animosity, but laying out historical prejudices and grudges so we can face them as a globe. To do this, I have a very special element to my books which is where we get to the cultural reset, the Armex, and the unknown. <coughs> so now that I've set up this plausible stage with the World Union, I throw in a twist. The Armex, or Armed Reserve Mecca of the Xeno Organization, is a secret paramilitary society existing beneath our feet, formed in the 1950s to deal with a predicted alien invasion. The Armex members are abducted from the outside world into the secret society and trained to fight the alien threat. But in this society, you have people from all over the world. So it's kind of like college, because you have a microcosm of the world that has to realign themselves in their purpose. They have to meet the person they may consider the other, or their enemy, and they have to work together towards a greater good. This changes the ideas of borders even more than the World Union, because now the World Union is a small border, and the big border is the whole world itself, because the opponent is coming from space. This isn't a typical story of alien invasion, though. It's not linear or traditional. You won't see everyone banding together to fight aliens, and you won't see 
aliens saying, take me to your leader. It uses the elements I spoke of before. So, for instance, the aliens behave in a more sporadic manner that occurs more like natural disasters or terrorist attacks. As such, people don't exactly know what's going on, and the political leaders of the World Union have to decide how to handle this, especially since the ones best equipped to handle this, the RMX, are an organization that has no official allegiance to any of these governments. What will the official government do? Will they cover up the incidents, quarantining people and censoring the media? Will they try to capture and coerce agents of the RMX to work for their political agendas? Will the aliens be interpreted as divine judgment and thus be used for recruitment tools for radicals? For that matter, does the alien threat cause destabilizing forces that urge nationalist groups to secede from this world union, which is already in a shaky state? I treat the alien threat as a dynamical a system, affecting political systems, religious beliefs, economies, and even people's relationships with one another. It creates all sorts of questions about a threat beyond humanity, which in turn really creates the question of the threats we bring upon ourselves as humanity. And while the very idea of aliens seems fantastical on the surface, the Vatican, a politically recognized entity as recently as September of this year, has publicly stated that it's only a matter of time before alien life forms are discovered. Japan itself has been host to a number of well-documented encounters with UFOs, or Mikakun and Hikobutai, following and interfering with airliners of theirs, including 1965 and 1986, we had blowing objects stalking airliners for extended periods of time, affecting electronic and navigational systems. These kinds of stories were reported in Reuters, United Press International, Tokyo Japan Times, San Francisco Chronicle, and the Mainichi Shimbun. Even the former U.S. chief of the FAA has gone on the record about the latter case in 1986. Now, no one knows what the cause of these events were. They could, there could be a normal explanation. But since they're historical... Uh, Mysteries, they create room for exploration to develop a curious mind. Too much hubris is never a good thing because regardless of the topic, science and history are always changing. But I don't want my novels to give easy answers. I think that inserting the unknown brings uh, into question how much we assume we know everything and it promotes critical thinking on how the unknown might affect our lives because we all have to kind of expect the unexpected in this world. So, for instance, in book three, character Yuki Sakamoto, who was thrust into the arm action Japan, talks about Foo Fighters. And I'm not talking about the American rock band Foo Fighters. She's talking about Foo Fighters, which were another historical mystery, fast glowing balls that followed aircraft in both theaters during World War II. She has a diary, or her family does, of an ancestor who flew for Imperial Japan and encountered these things. She affectionately calls him Ryu-sama, and in his diary, he dubs these Foo Fighters as Kamisora, or Sky Spirits. Kami from the Shinto Japanese referring to divine spirit, God, and Sora, the Japanese word for sky. Which brings into question in my books whether if you do encounter something unknown like these UFOs, are they always alien in nature, or is it something else altogether? This is just one of the many cultural conversations that occur within the RMX, which is a meeting place for people from all over the World Union but is hidden from the World Union. So you, you allow all of these different conversations about their histories, their cultures, their experiences with the unknown, their families, even relationships emerge from this. And this speaks to the title of my book series, Universal War RMX. The universal war is a sociological term coined during the high ideals of the classical revolution that made the World Union. It's beyond a world war. The universal war is a war between worlds, between Earth and space, but symbolically it references the struggles of mind, spirit, and body that occur within all people as they face this uncertain reality and adapt to it. So when you sum all of this up, my experiences and my intentions are about bridging generations, bridging cultures, and bridging the future in an engaging way. I want to give substance, but I want it to be a thrill ride. It's about older generations reconciling convictions of their past and young generations seeking out interpersonal growth and meaning within an uncertain and rapidly changing world, just like we're living in today. So when Dr. Bohr invited me to speak to you, I wanted to tie my journey of my work to some of the journey you've been taking in this class and will be taking in the future. In the end, Japan's use of creativity, especially following World War II, to process and explore its own history of war and peace isolation and integration, East and West, 
have ultimately inspired my own explorations in writing to bridge the future and inspire critical thinking about our world. And with that, whatever our discipline, whatever our history may be, we're all called to be bridges to the future.